<laughs> All right, we're going to shift gears a little bit today and look at a different example. I mean, we're going to do the same basic stuff we've been doing all along, of course. It's not like we're going to shift gears and this is going to become like a French class or something, you know. Uh, but uh, we're going to look at a different example. And we're going to look at an example where the objects to do the database interaction are created by us programmatically as opposed to created uh, by, um, by us by going through the GUI and IDE and dragging the thing on the page and clicking configure and so on and so forth. There's a place for that to be sure, all right? But in some instances, you may not necessarily want to do that. For one thing, it's always good to know what's going on behind the scenes and to understand on that level. So even just as an exercise, it's valuable. It's also valuable because sometimes you might want to do database interactivity without displaying something on the screen. Right now, all the database interactivity we've had have result in something popping up on the screen. But let's think of, say, a password, for example. Hey, looky here. Got a password right here. So I go and type my username and password here. And click sign in. You know some database interactivity is going to go on, right? It's running out to the database and it's going to grab information about me. All right, it's going to make sure that my user ID and password are valid. What's more, it's going to look to see what kind of user I am. Right, because that matters. Um, uh, uh, everyone in here is in CISS 243 on Canvas, but not everyone can go in and grade or make assignments or, or whatever. All right, so I have different permissions than you, so I'm sure that's stored in some database table, and that's going to be retrieved as well. But yeah, we don't see anything like that appearing on the screen. So we want to do some database interactivity, but there's no like visual component to it. All the examples we've gone over so far, there's been a visual component to it, right? We go and type in a search for a particular person and boom, up comes a list of people that match that name. We click on a link, boom, we go over to that page and so on. So what we're going to do here is a little different than that. We are going to uh, do database access without having a visual component and we're going to do that by doing it programmatically. In other words, we're going to write the instructions that are going to do that. Now, another thing to note when I log on here is it remembers who I am throughout the whole process. All right? And yet, it's not on the query string. The query string was one way that we saw for passing data between pages. This remembers who I am, and I can, there's a dashboard, these are all the classes I teach. <laughs> it's a light semester. Yeah. Uh, I'm only behind in grading like half the time. I go in like two week cycles, I think. You know, I like, like for example, last week I worked my butt off to, to get caught up on grading. And I'm exhausted now, so <laughs> I didn't do much over the weekend, and now I'm having a hard time getting back in the swing, so I'll probably fall behind, so I'll have to kick butt again next week to get vicious cycle. All right, so I will go and click over here. Through each step of this process, it remembers who I am, all right, and it remembers that I'm a professor. So I can go and add a module, or I can add something to week one, or whatever. And yet, that's not being passed on the query string. All right, so it's being passed in a different way. So I'm going to download this example. And we're going to take a look at it. This example, if I remember right, is like for like a summer little league or something, you know, where you register for a team and blah, blah, blah. All right, so 
let me go and open up that app. And we'll make sure we know how it works first. That is, we'll make sure we understand the behavior of it. Then we'll look in to see actually how it's coded. We're going to see if we can trick people into thinking that the video has stopped. All right, so we'll drive people crazy when they're watching a the video. It'd be nice if I could put the little animation that YouTube shows saying it's buffering or something. Buffering. Yeah. <laughs> So this is the summer league, and you have to log on to see your player info, which makes sense, right? You wouldn't want just anyone to be able to go in and change your address. You would you'd want to make sure that it is a valid person. So I look at the tables that we have here in the database, and we have just a player table. And let's look. It was associated with the table. A user ID and password. So the user ID for me is MLZ and password. The user ID for Huffman is DH and the standard CISS125 password. All right, so let's go and run this. Type in my user ID, MLZ, and password. And there I am. All right, I see my information. Now, I can't edit it yet, but that will be one of the things that we'll do next, is, is give us the ability to edit it. All right. Um, in addition... Let's close out of this. Let's try to get to the player info without going through the login page. Right? We shouldn't be able to do that. So I'm going to set player info as my start page. And I'm going to run this. So I go to access player info. <coughs> And it allows me to access it, but it doesn't show anything, which is incorrect. So that's something we better take care of. All right, so it's on our list of things to do. All right, I wasn't sure where this example was at, um, so I was uh, trying.
trying the different things to see where it is. All right. So let's go back to the default page. And the default page When we do the retrieve of the person, it's not like we're displaying a grid view or a detail view on that page. We're going to another page and we're displaying the grid or the, the detail view there. Let's put Huffman in. You get his information. Pardon me? It's almost like I planned that. Right. Okay. So the bottom line is, is we're doing database access without having a comparable visual control. We're doing it behind the scenes. We're doing it in the code behind. So we are programmatically creating those objects. And then we are remembering who we are when we go to another page. All right. So far, we've seen a couple different ways to remember stuff between pages. All right. You can remember a form control between pages, right? So like as some of you found out, like on your department search for uh, whatever assignment that was, if you pick a department and click submit, it posts it back to the server, and that department still shows up in the form field. So it remembers what you put in, all right? Um, so through a form field, you can remember between two pages or two instances of a page, two requests is probably the best way to put it. We saw how you can pass data on the query string last time, whereas you click a link and that link says something like detail.aspx question mark id equals five, where five is the primary key and so the second page can pull up the person that has a primary key of five. All right, so we've seen that as well. None of those are what we're doing here. We're not using a form control to remember who that is. All right? And we're not using the query string. I mean, we didn't see anything on the query string. And in this particular case, um, while we only have two pages, um, if there were more pages, and we'll add more pages onto here, um, if there were more pages, it would remember who we were on those pages as well. All right. So that's a different kind of remembering. All these things are called state management or maintaining state on a, uh, in a web application. That means like remembering what happened before. So remembering that we have successfully logged in as Mike Zellers is uh, an example of maintaining state. And we're not using a form control to do that. We're not using the query string. We're using what are called session variables. What do I mean by a browser session? What creates a browser session? Pardon me? A browser variable. Uh, there can be variables associated with sessions. But what creates a session? What do I mean when I say a browser session? Is that the opening of the browser? That means opening the browser and going to a web page. I've created a session on that web page. So for example, if I were to go in and um, open up uh, Amazon, all right, I've created a session on Amazon server. So Amazon server knows about, knows something about me based on that, all right? I go and log in, all right? Do I have to log in every page I go to on Amazon? No. I log in once and it remembers me um, as I search around and add things to my cart and so on. When does it forget who I am? You exit out of the page. <clears throat> well, one, thing, one way is if I exit completely out of the browser, it might forget who I am. All right, that's one possibility. What's another possibility of, of, of making it forget who I am? If you're, not active. if you're not active for a period of time, it'll time out and it will forget who you are. And what's the reason for that? No way, like if you leave it, someone else can. Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's partly for a security reason, all right? Uh, a 
in other words, if I were to uh, stay log, you know, if I were to log on to Canvas or, or Gmail or Amazon or whatever in a public computer and go away, um, eventually it would log out. You know, after 20 minutes, maybe after an hour, hour and a half, whatever. So part of the reason is is a security thing. You know, if, if you're not active, it's assumed that you've gone away, so it logs you out automatically. All right. Um, for banking applications, that may be actually a very short period of time. I know, like, for example, um, you know, I, I just saw this the other day. I don't know, I looked something up on my bank account, and it seemed like five or ten minutes later it says, hey, you haven't been doing anything. We're logging you out. All right. What's another reason for logging someone out? If they are not active, yes. Let's uh, strain on the database. Let's strain on the server. Server doesn't have to devote resources to them anymore. So it's a win-win situation. So if you haven't been active for 20 minutes, it still remembers who you are. Now, funny thing is, is you may have left Amazon and gone to ESPN and reading that page. All right. The server doesn't know that you have left Amazon. It just knows it hasn't gotten any more requests from you. All right? So you don't notify a server when you go somewhere else. You only notify a server with requests. So how does it figure out that you're done and gone somewhere else? Well, if it hasn't gotten a request within X amount of time, it's going to log you off. And it logs you off partly for your protection so that someone couldn't come up and, and see your banking information or whatever. But it also logs you off to lessen the load on the server. That's one less thing the server has to worry about now, is who this person is that logged on from such and such IP address. All right, so it's a win-win situation. How long should a server wait before it logs you off? Uh, like you said, with banking, it depends on what it's worth. Yeah, I, I, I kind of kind of gave a spoiler there. It depends on what it is, right? For example, Canvas. How long should it wait before it logs you off? All right, 15 minutes or more. Yes. Will that always be the case? Is there some time where if it logged you off in 15 minutes on Canvas, it could be a problem? When you're watching a video. When you're watching a video, taking a test. All right. So you could actually set, you can actually have a default timeout for your server, and you can also actually set the timeout to a different value for a particular page. So they may have as a general rule canvas that you log off after 15 minutes, all right? The server forgets you, all right? Um, or you go to a certain page that is either a video or is a test or whatever, they could make that a longer period of time so you don't log off in the middle of the test, which wouldn't be good. All right? So at that point, the session is done, though. Whenever it times out, it's done and it forgets about you. Um, what's another way that you could end a browser session besides timing out, Closing a browser window. Even that won't really end the session until it times out. So really, timeout is the one way that we've seen so far. And that timeout could be because we closed the browser window, we've walked away, whatever. What's another way that you could end a session? To log out. To, log out. to click the link that says log out. That's telling the, the, uh, the, the, the server, hey, I am done here. You don't need to remember me anymore. All right? Which is, again, a win-win situation. You then don't have the potential of your information being compromised, and the server can forget about you without having to wait the extra 15 or 20 minutes. Now, how does it work when it remembers who you are between browser sessions? That is, for example, if I were to bring up on my laptop Amazon right now, I didn't have a browser session open. I wasn't there 20 minutes ago. All right, I probably it's been a few days since I've been to Amazon. But if I were to open up Amazon, it would know who I am. How does it do that? It could be based on your IP address, but there's probably another way. Partly through 
browser settings, but I heard a good answer over here. Cookies. Cookies, right? And what is cookie? A cookie is a little file that it stores on your machine that contains whatever the website wants it to contain. All right? So um, that's why if you notice, if you go to Gmail where it says log on, uh, or on many sites, it will say, do you want to remember who I am? All right? What that is saying is, do, I, do you want to create a cookie or not? All right, because if you say, no, don't remember who I am, then it won't create a cookie, which means that it will remember you for this browser session, but when the browser session ends, it doesn't know who you are. Whereas if you say, create a cookie, then it will remember you until that cookie either expires, which you can set an expiration date on a cookie, uh, or um, you manually go in and clear out the cookies reset your browser history or whatever. All right, so we're going to remember who someone is via a session ID. All right, or I'm sorry, a session variable. We're going to put the ID of the user in the session variable. Now let's look at the database. The database is pretty simple in this case. We have simply a player table. contains a player ID, which is an auto number. It contains first name and last name, an email address, a user ID, and a user password. Why is there a separate user ID here? Why is there a separate user ID here? What other things could I maybe use? I could maybe use email. Why didn't I? Well, when I set this table up, I said that the email isn't required. So everyone isn't required to have an email. Therefore, I couldn't use that. I could hardly use that as a logon. All right. What about name? Pardon me? So you have multiple people with the same name. If you, if you have people with the same name, you know, there's a possibility that you could have that, in which case, that would cause problems. What about player ID, the auto number? Could I use that to log on? They won't know the number. Yeah, they, they, either they won't know the number or, or if they do know it, it'll be hard for them to remember or whatever. So usually, you know, sites like this would either use like an email address or a, a user ID. So I chose to use a user ID, which is a short text. Now, notice that the user ID is defined as required, and is defined as indexed with no duplicates. What does that mean? Can't have two, the same user ID. Can't have two people with the same user ID, which makes sense, right? If it's MLZ, there better be one MLZ, right? There can't be two MLZs. So, in other words, this could be um, a primary key because everyone has to have one and it has to be unique. So this is a candidate key, but we chose to make the auto number the key, largely because it's easier to store numbers, less space to store numbers than, um, than characters. Question? Just kind of off top of it, the allow zero length part about that? If yeah. If you did like a space, would that allow like user name to be a space? Or how does That's that a good question. I'm not familiar with access enough to answer that. Um, that being said, I probably should not set it to yes. <laughs> that was probably an oversight. All right. So, logging on. What is logging on going to consist of? Well, I go to log on. I enter in a user ID and password. So what is the SQL statement going to look like to see if I've successfully logged on? Username name matches with the password? Username matches the ID. Username matches the ID. 
What's my login page look like? Uh, you have two text boxes and a button. I have two text boxes and a button. So what's my SQL statement going to look like? Close. What's wrong with what, what he said? He said something like this. Select something. That actually doesn't matter as much. The where clause is what I'm interested in right now. From player where user ID equals question mark. And the question mark gets filled in from where? Text box. What's wrong with that? Pardon me? Yeah, it doesn't check for the password. So all it would take to log on would be to get the person's user ID right. Yeah, it's not really good. So what should the where clause look like? You folks have logged on to something before, right? Okay. When can when are you allowed to log on? When your user ID matches the user ID, not the user ID matches the password, right? I mean, my user ID is M Zellers. My password is not M Zellers, all right? But when my user ID matches the user ID that's stored in the database, and my password matches the user ID in the database. So if I have two text boxes and a button, the user ID and password I want to make sure that the user ID, I'm going to select the information from the database, from that table where user ID equals the user ID text box and Password equals the value of that text box. So, what am I going to get if someone logs in successfully? How many rows am I going to get if someone logs in successfully? One. I'm only going to get one row if someone logs in successfully. Why? Because the user ID is unique. All right? So that means that they, if there's an MLZ out there, there's only one of them. All right? What would I get if I type in an incorrect user ID, a user ID that does not exist? So instead of MLZ, I type in just MZ. How many rows will I get? Zero. What if I type in a user ID correctly, but I type in the wrong password? So I type in MLZ as a user ID, but Fred as a password. What, how many rows will I get? Okay, so in other words, when this statement executes, I am either getting one or zero rows returned. All right, so how do I know if I've logged on successfully or not? If I got one row, I've logged on successfully. If I've gotten zero rows, I have not logged on successfully. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to execute this statement. I'm going to fill in the user ID and password from the text boxes. I'm going to execute that statement. Then I'm going to look to see how many rows I got. I either got one or zero. It's my only two choices. If it's one, I've logged on. If it's zero, I'm not correct. Yes? Right. To see, to find a user. Right. We only have one with a name. Right. Now the password, we all can have same passwords. Correct. Which we shouldn't, but so at some point it should match user ID with the password. It's not matching, okay, let, let's say for a 
example, we have two people in our, we well, have three people in our database. We have MLZ, DH, and PN. MLZ's password is password. D. Huffman's password is his favorite password. And Paul Norod's password is also password. All right. So, I go to log in. All right. And I type in MLZ and password. Will I get a row? Will my select statement return a row? Yes. Yes. So it will plug in MLZ into there. It will plug password into there. Is there a row where both the user ID equals MLZ and password equals password? Yes, there is. Let's say I type in MLZ and Huffman's password. Does MLZ, is there a row where the user ID is MLZ and the password is PA dollar sign dollar sign WORD? No, there isn't. So how many rows do I get back? Zero. Zero. If I type in any old goofy password, how many rows do I get back? Zero. So if I get the user ID right and I get the password wrong and the password does not match the password that's on the database for that person, then I don't return any rows. So what does what you're asking about is the and. Those both conditions have to be true. So for a given row to be selected, the user ID has to match that and the password has to match that. All right. So in other words, if I were to type in, this is probably the most, this is one of the important test cases here. If I type that in, there is no row for which the user ID is MLZ and the password is PA dollar sign dollar sign. All right. This one matches the user ID, but not the password. So the and condition is false, because it doesn't match the user ID and the password. This one matches the password, but not the user ID. So again, the and condition is false. This one matches neither of them, all right? Therefore, it's false, okay? Now, again, if Noron logs in, He has the same password as me. He clicks submit. It's going to find Norad's row because his user ID matches the user ID and the password matches the password. All right, so the fact that we have the same password doesn't matter. All right, good question. All right, so let's see the magic working. The fun starts on the server side. Code. And let me make this a little bigger. still retrieving data from the database, right? So we still have a SQL data source, just like we had before. What's the difference of it, uh, uh, with it? The difference of it is it's not one that we plopped on the page, but it's one that we're going to create through our code. All right? So I create a SQL data source object that I named OBJDS. So that's what this line does. That creates the SQL data source. Now, 
SQL Data Source, if you remember when we set this up last week when we did this, when we configure the data source, we have to tell it a couple things. We have to tell it the database connection that we're talking about. All right. So remember, we went, we selected a database connection, and we said connection one or whatever. Then we had to define what the SQL statement was that we wanted. Then we had to specify if there are any parameters, where those parameters come from. Well, that's exactly what we do here. All right. The first two lines, after creating the object, sets the connection string. And these I don't expect anyone to memorize. All right. I'm setting the provider name and the connection string, and I'm pulling it from the web config file. And my, the name of the connection string I'm pulling is called, in the web config file, connection string. So here's our connection string in the web config file. It has a connection string and it has a provider name. We're simply setting we're simply setting our data sources provider name and connection string to the value that's stored in the web config file. And we're looking for the name of connection string. So now this is pointing at the right database. All right, we're pointing at the right database. We now have to define what our select statement is. What is our query that we want to pull? Well, what did we say it's going to be? Well, I had select star up there, but in my actual code I have select player ID. I need to know the player ID because the player ID is a primary key of the player table. All right, select player ID from player where user ID equals question mark and user password equals question mark. All right, that's essentially that instruction that we had up there. All right, and that we talked about and we talked about how that worked. All right, those are parameters. Those aren't hard coded. I'm not going to be always logging in as M Zellers or DH or, or Paul Norad. All right, I'm going to be going to be logging on as someone different each time. All right, or people are going to be logging on as someone different each time. So I have to say where those parameters come from. The user ID parameter comes from text box user ID text. The password comes from text box password text. And um, pretty sure the order matters, although I'm not 100% if the order or the name matters, or both. I would not tempt fate, though. I'd put them in the same order and give them the same name. So now our SQL data source is ready for action, all right? Because we've defined everything that we need to about a SQL data source. And these are the same things that we defined when we went through the GUI to define them. We define the database connection, which actually is two parts, the connection string and the um, provider. So we do that in two lines of code. We set the connection information. We set the select command. And finally, we select where the values of the parameters are going to be populated from. We need then to be able to execute that statement and do something with the results. Okay? There's several ways that we can do this. This is the simplest way, the most straightforward way. All right? Whereas we're simply going to create what's called a data reader. When you think about it, what do we want to do with this data? Not much, right? We simply want to see if, if something got returned, right? And we then, if something did get returned, we know that they logged on correctly. And we know that, um, oh, 
we want we want to remember what their what their player ID is. So, I create a data reader. A data reader allows us to sequentially read through a data set. What does that mean? It means that we can look at the first. Uh, record that's returned, the second record, the third record, the fourth record, and so on. Normally, this read statement would be in a loop because we could loop through all the values that were returned to do something. But guess what? We know by definition that we only have one of two possibilities. There is something there or there is nothing there. All right? So, once I've defined my data reader, all right, I read the data reader. What do you suppose that this statement returns if there's data there? There's a row there. It returns true. What do you suppose it returns if there's no data there? False. So we have an if statement here. If I do a read, it's going to look at the first row in the data set. Well, we know we only got one row, right, at most. So we don't have to loop and loop through all of them. All right? So one read is sufficient to tell if they've logged in successfully or not. We do that read. If that read found something, then we have a winner. All right? They are successfully logged on. In which case, I can remember the session ID, I can remember the player ID in a session ID called player ID, and I can redirect them to the player information page. That's the page that displays the player information. If, however, this read returned nothing, then I simply display a message saying that it is not a successful login, and we don't redirect. Now, session player ID equals my data sub zero. What does that mean? Well, when we select the list of columns, each of these columns gets numbered. This is column zero. The next column would be column one. The next column would be column two. But we only got the one column. So column zero is the only field that we retrieve. So this says for my data reader, from whatever row I'm looking at, give me column zero, which is, of course, the player ID. So we store that in a session variable. This is how you create a session variable. This creates a session variable called player ID. So we put that in that session variable. Now anyone, any of my other application, uh, or pages rather, within this application can read that session variable and do something with it. Well, let's look at player info. What do you suppose player info is going to do? It, well, not from the query string, but from the session variable. It's going to pull the user ID from the session, or I'm sorry, the player ID from the session variable, and it's going to plug it into a SQL statement to pull up all the player's information. So let's look at the player info page. Actually, no code there at all. What we do have is a details view and a SQL data source. This SQL data source uses a connection string, executes a SQL statement. SQL statement says select star from player where player ID equals question mark. Well, where are we getting that question mark? And last week we got it sometimes from a form control, sometimes from the query string. Now we're pulling that value of that question mark from the session ID, or the session variable for player ID. So our parameter source is a session variable. 
and the name of the field is player ID. You can create a session variable that stores a bunch of different values. So I could store the person's name in a different session variable. And you create that the same way. All right, simply by saying, um, simply by saying session and then in the square brackets have the name of the variable that you want to create. Let's run this through debug. All right. Um, I think we know what debug is for. We talked about it. I'm not sure if I've used it much in this class, but debug is a systematic way of tracking through your code to find errors. In other words, if this didn't work, we could stare at it as long as we want to, but it's not likely that the problem would jump out. So like if, if you go to a doctor and you say your arm hurts, all right, the doctor isn't just going to guess and say, well, yeah, you probably got a broken shoulder here, let me put you in a cast. All right? The doctor's going to do an x-ray or an MRI or whatever. And then once they see really what's going on, then they can prescribe the, the cure. Sort of the same thing with programming. Um, if your program isn't working, you sort of need to x-ray it. You sort of need to look inside the code and see what's actually executing. And from that, then, you can decide if there is a problem, what's wrong. In our case, there's no problem here, but we're going to use the x-ray anyhow. All right. So I'm going to put in default.aspx, we're going to put a breakpoint here. What's a breakpoint? A breakpoint is when I run this in debug mode, when it hits this statement, it's going to, the program's going to stop and I can look at some things. So let me go in and debug this. How do you know where you want to put breakpoint? How does a doctor know what to x-ray? <laughs> no, but we yeah. have a lot of code to Well, well, well you, you, you got a lot of parts of the body too, right? So how does a doctor know what x-rays? What are you complaining about? Where do you have the problem with? Now, in the case of a program, it could be that there's five pieces of functionality in it and four of the five are working correctly. So you probably don't need a breakpoint there. You need a breakpoint like where that one piece of functionality that doesn't work, where that starts. So I wouldn't put, you know, I'd, I'd go and find the area that I thought the problem was probably in, and then I would go and put a breakpoint in there. Now, if you really don't know, I guess this is where the doctor analogy falls apart, but like if there was someone unconscious, they couldn't tell you what hurts, they might have to like x-ray the whole body, right, or whatever. I don't know, I'm not a doctor. In which case, you'd put a breakpoint like as soon as you press the button, and then you could see assuming it was a button press where the problem occurred, all right? So it's kind of like, you know, where you suspect there's a problem, you put that in. Now, the one thing I will say is, <clears throat> if your code isn't working, don't be too sure you know what the problem is, all right? Just like you can have pain in your leg that is caused by something in your back, all right? So don't be so sure if you have a symptom in one part of your programming program that you know where the problem is. All right? So try to make as few assumptions as possible as to what goes wrong or, or what is going wrong. All right? Okay. I'm going to log in incorrectly. I'm going to put in my username and I'm just going to type some garbage in for the password. And I click log in. So now it pops in and we're x-raying the code. It's showing us the instructions it's doing. This is a code for a button click. So what it's doing is going to create my SQL data source. And I can do step into. It's setting the configuration uh, from the configuration file. It's setting the provider and 
in the connection string, I'm clicking step into. I'm setting the SQL statement. I'm setting the parameters. I'm defining my data reader. Um, or I'm defining that this data source is going to use a data reader, which means I'm accessing it in sort of a read-only, read from the beginning to the end, because that's all I really need to do. I then get prepare that data reader. And now, I'm at the point where I'm actually going to I have executed, so my data contains my results. We can even look at that down here. My data contains the results. And notice what it says under results. I panicked for a second because I forgot I was doing a, a, a bad login. It says enumeration yielded no results. So in other words, it did the read. At this point, it did the select statement. So it accessed the data. And at this point, it's telling me my data has nothing in it. So when I try to read the first row in it, there is no first row. So this read is going to fail. And therefore, I'm not going to do the true part of this. I'm going to do the false part. So I click step into. I think I screwed something up in the debugger. Let's try this again. Let's just put garbage in here. So at this point, there's nothing in the data reader, and therefore I go in and display unsuccessful. And boop, there we go. Let's log in correctly this time. I'm there. Same thing, create the selection, create this, blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> Go and retrieve the data. At this point, something with that in debug, which is weird. Okay, it does the read. It should find something this time because I logged in correctly. And therefore, it's at this point. And what it's saying is set the session ID to my, D, my data sub zero. If I look at my data, some sort of bug of, because it's telling me that the, the thing is closed. I'm not sure why it's doing that. But I'll run it without any interruption here and log in. So every time you 
expand that. Yeah, every time I expand it, it must think that I'm done using it or something. So if I log in correctly, Successful log on, redirect people there. I go and call this, and there I go with my information. Questions about this? Now, the way my code is written. Am I able to differentiate between if they have logged in with an invalid user ID or an invalid password? No. That's why it always says your user ID or your password is wrong. Okay. <laughs> is that a good thing? No. Anyone have another viewpoint on that? Well, I don't think it's that big of a deal because if you ever need to like reset your password, they make you enter your username anyway. And if, if it's right, then it's right, and they'll let you reset your password. But somebody was trying to log in as you. Yeah, security reasons. for security reasons. <laughs> if someone knew my user ID, all right, and and someone said, well, let's see. Is, is his user ID ML Zellers? And it said invalid user ID. Okay, I'll try M Zellers. M Zellers, invalid password. I now know that I got half of it right. Right? So, telling me which one is wrong is better for a legit user who simply forgot their user ID or password. Right? Unfortunately, it's also better for someone trying to log into someone else. So that would be a design decision that you have to make. Usually, what people will do, and this is why you see so many of them, is they won't tell you. They're going to err on the side of security and not give someone who's trying to break in to your account the information of whether they got the user ID or password correct. And that is to... Um, just give an error message saying that you did not log in correctly. Um, user ID or password's wrong. Then what do you do if you've forgotten your user ID? Then you supply your email address. All right? And that way, if someone's guessing M Zellers, ML Zellers, blah, 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 even if they know my email address and type it in, the email is going to come to me <laughs> saying, hey, your user ID is ML Zellers. It's like, yeah, I know that. Someone must be trying to access my account. All right? Question? What about case? That is, will my code match if I use uppercase for either the user ID or the password? Um, do you have to do like the like percentage thing 
for it to be able to just kind of guess what you want to enter in there, regardless of case. For do you want them to guess? Yeah, I was going to say, the like would be more like, um, I know my username ends with Zellers, but I don't know if it's M Zellers, Mike Zellers, ML Zellers, something like that. The like does isn't really relevant as far as case goes. Well, let's see. Are you have a guess? Well, let's say in the code you could do for username at least, like if you want to watch the code, you can dot two lower and it would make it all lowercase in the code. Like dot lower and it would lowercase. Okay. You could do that. Let, let's, let's make sure we understand the problem here, and then we can talk about how to fix it. But yeah, that would be one potential part of a solution. I'm going to long I hit my cap locks button. So cap locks is on. I'm going to type in my user ID in all caps because I am mad today. And it's warning me that my, my cap locks is on, by the way. But I type it in anyhow and click log on. And looky, it logs me on. Do you like that? Again, you could you could answer yes or no, right? I mean, sometimes, um, you know, user ID, you know, I, or, or email address or whatever, um, you know, yeah, it doesn't really matter what the case is. And I could use too low or, or whatever um, to do that. Um, passwords? I don't know. I, I don't know if I like a non-case sensitive password. All right. Now databases, we've seen this before. Databases, generally speaking, are not case sensitive. Now there could be settings that you could set and blah, blah, blah to do that. But generally speaking, and, that, and that's a good thing, right? Because if I'm looking for a book and, um, you know, I want to look up uh, books that have physics in the title because I want to read about physics. Um, it probably would be bad if the capitalization mattered, right? Because I just want to see physics books. I don't care if it's capital P or lowercase p. All right? Okay. But for passwords, it does matter. So what could we do to make it so that it is case sensitive? If the database isn't case sensitive, then then what can we do? I'll give you a hint. The answer isn't going to be on the database side of things, right? Because we've already seen the database has failed us here. <laughs> All right, the database is not going to be is not up to this task. Is there a property for that? There could be a property for that. Uh, but what I'm thinking of more of, and, and if I, well, I would, I would have to check, that would depend a lot on the individual database, because I probably don't want other queries to be case sensitive, all right? Uh, just this one. Well, what I would do is I would actually pull in the username and password from the database, and then check also in the code to verify that that is correct. So what I could do is Repeat that please. Is there any danger in pulling that password in? Um, is there any like can it be passed on and then like some hacker would code in there and pass that password on something? Someone would have to put code in your C sharp file, so that's that's that probably would not be the way that a hacker would attack. Alright. What we'd have to do is we'd actually have to change this. Um, after we read it, we're assuming it's logged in. What what I would do is instead I would pull the player ID, user ID, and user password from 
from here, after I have a valid read, I would check in my C-sharp code, which is going to be case sensitive, if my data My data sub zero, oh, I'm sorry, sub one equals text box user ID. My data two equals text box password dot text. If that was true, then we would have a successful login. Otherwise, we would simply say it's unsuccessful. Now, if we wanted to be nice at this point, we could say, hey, is your cap locks on? by the way, all right? Of course, anything that we do that's nice to a legit user who just happens to get it wrong is also being nice to someone trying to log on as that person. So you have to decide if that's something that you would want to do or not. So logging in is one instance of this sort of processing, all right? There's a lot of other cases where you would want to do a query, but not necessarily display the results on the screen. For example, you might not want to allow someone to delete a professor if they have courses out there, right? Makes sense. If, if I'm scheduled for teaching courses, it probably would not be a good idea to delete me from the database. So I could actually do a query, see how many courses I have. If I have zero courses, then enable the delete button. Otherwise, disable the delete button. All right. So any kind of queries that you want to run that you don't necessarily have a, uh, a need to display the results on the screen, but you want to use the information from the query to do something else, you could um, use this sort of strategy where you programmatically create the classes or the objects that you need to, to do a query, retrieve the data, and then do something with the results. All right, this example is available out there. I posted it prior to class. Um, your design is due someday this week. Is it today or is it Thursday? Does anyone have questions about your project design? All right. If you do have questions, something specific or individual, we can discuss them in the lab. All right. We'll see you over in lab.